So uh, I'll, I'll just start by saying that we're not going to talk about logos, we're not going to talk about design proper for identity design, we can talk about that stuff later. Uh, we're going to talk about this morning is branding and kind of the general practice of branding. Um, I'm not a brand specialist, I don't really care about branding, I just know that we experience it every day, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a different take on what branding actually means uh, for us day to day folks. Um, so I'm going to start by showing you a little video that I think will set up the mood for what we're going to talk about. And I wasn't sure if we were, were going to have uh, an internet connection, so I hope that these two minutes that we're going to see now uh, they don't count as my 10 minute talk. So um, we'll have a little introduction that doesn't count that uh, in my allotted time. All right? So just to set, well, this blows. Um, so this is from American Gangster uh, with Denzel Wa Washington and another um, talented ensemble. Um, and I don't know if you've all seen it, but uh, what he does, uh, Denzel becomes a gangster and he imports some of the best uh, heroin, opium, I don't know, I'm not into drugs. They all, they're all the same to me. Uh, but what he does, he, he imports this really great drug and he, marks it, he market, markets it uh, as Blue Magic. And the scene that we're going to see right now is uh, with Cuba Gooding Jr., who has taken his blue magic and cut it off, and you know he's diluted it and selling it uh, um, as blue magic, but not the same quality. And he's about to get a brand lesson from Denzel Washington. <laughs> the language is not safe for work, so if that kind of stuff offends you, you, know, um, you can uh, sing loud and lie to your. <laughs> And then there's you. you know, they want to get to you no matter how. They have the brand promises, the brand essence, the brand sounds, the brand vision. Whatever they have, it all encompasses this big red circle. And it's all about getting to you, no matter what. Um, so for example, you know, take a brand like Starbucks. Uh, it's all about, you know, it's the corner coffee store. When you walk in, it smells like, you know, freshly roasted coffee. There's the barista that knows your name. There's all, all the friendly faces, your neighbors. It's kind of like this warm, fuzzy feeling when you walk into Starbucks. Whether you like the coffee or not, if you're a Dunkin' Donuts coffee person, that's fine. But when you walk into Starbucks, you know that you're going to have a sort of color palette that fits a certain brand standard that they've established pretty clearly. Um, 
uh, you know, in many, many stores throughout the US. Then you, know, then you have Apple, which is kind of like this crystalline oasis of uh, you know, amazing technology in a desert of beige technology you know, by Dell, uh, Microsoft, etc. And you know, the, the store on uh, 55th Street is kind of like the epitome of, of Apple brand. It's kind of it's clear, perfect uh, lines, and you know, there's a certain romanticism to it that you know, people come from all over the world just to see that store. But, um, what branding doesn't really count is that count on is that there's reality between what they between their branding and you. So you know this is the image that Starbucks wants to engender in our minds, but this is really what happens. We have people in you know sloppy clothing. They are using their PCs. Why is the lighting so bad in here? Is there anything we can do about the the screen because we? We're missing the details. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. Uh, that helps, but I don't know. Sorry, we'll take a little uh, break before. You could just like write it off the screen. There we go. Yes, exactly. It's fast. That's as good as it gets. see a little bit more of that heart. So as I was saying, you know, that's how, uh, yeah, that's a little bit of the reality of Starbucks. You can people that are freelancers, or especially today, they're out of work and they're just there updating their Twitter accounts or Facebook accounts or whatever, or their resume. That's what they should be working on, their resume. <laughs> and you know, if you get down to it, you know, Starbucks can be a really depressing scene. You have all these students with their laptops getting their, you know, free seating, free Wi-Fi, and they're not buying any coffee. And you walk in there and you're with a coffee, maybe you're with, them with your son or daughter, you have nowhere to sit, and you have this guy like, it's long, students just hanging there all day. <laughs> not exactly the brand promise that Starbucks has uh, tried to do. And then, you know, again, Apple, pretty amazing, uh, until you have to talk to, uh, until you want to buy the iPhone on the first day, and you have to stand in line with a bunch of New Yorkers on a hot summer day. <laughs> so, uh, you know, branding is, as we, see, as we can see, you know, uh, there's this perfect view of branding that most companies want to tell you about, but sometimes, th sometimes uh, things can go wrong. Um, and I want to show you uh, just one example. It may be extreme, and it may actually be fictional, but I think it's an interesting uh, point of view. Um, I don't know if you've all seen the Idiocracy. It's a movie by Mike Judge. Uh, he did uh, Office Space and King of the Hill. And the basic premise of the movie is that Luke Wilson, Luke Wilson? Yeah. yeah. Luke Wilson and Maya Rudolph get, are part of a military experiment where they're supposed to be frozen for a year, but things go horribly wrong, and they wake up uh, 500 years in the future where brands have taken over all of um, the whole world. People are really dumb because, you know, just kind of like culture has uh, done down quite a bit. And I think 500 years from now, people are going to consider this a documentary more than a movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's so true. Um, and for example, what happens is uh, in the fast food chains, Cardis is the only brand that has survived. I'm not sure why Cardis <laughs> to beat. Um, the president is an African-American porn star. Uh, so we have the African-American product now. The next step in presidency is a porn star. Uh, you can see that the logos, are, what they've done in the movie is that they've taken all these logos and kind of like what happens if branding has really dumbed down. This is the kind of logos that you can get, some sort of uh, you know, postmodern Pepsi logo, which is far better than what they just did. Uh, <laughs> American Express with triple X, because everything is about sex and boobs and, you know, um, all that good stuff that some people like. Um, then water has been replaced by Brondo, which is kind of a Gator Gatorade-like drink. And you know, you go to water fountain and you press it, Brondo comes out. Um, and now they've, now they've actually they're, they've did a spin-off product that you can actually buy Brondo in some stores. So we're not that far from 500 years from now. Uh, Starbucks, again, the brand promise. Now it's a exotic coffee for men. Um, latte costs two thousand dollars for uh, five hundred million dollars for extra fall. <laughs> so the pricing is uh, 
adjusted for inflation. Now, uh, H&R Block, again, it's the average tax return from the gentleman's rebate. Um, you know, I think uh, it's actually a good idea. You know, you're sitting there waiting for your taxes to be made. A little pinch show might not be bad. Costco, you know, the, the greeters haven't gone away. This guy sits there all day and he greets you. He says, welcome to Costco, I love you. Uh, Costco has become so big that you can actually buy livestock. Um, you know, not too far from that either. Uh, interestingly, Fox News remains the same. <laughs> <laughs> so let's forget a little bit about you know the big picture of branding. You know, there's uh, all these com companies that spend you know th hundreds of thousands of dollars on their branding, millions of dollars in you know buying uh, television ads, billboards, whatever. Um, so let's forget about that for a little bit and let's focus on you know what is the day-to-day -day branding? How does uh, does branding translate to what we live every day? So, for example, you know, what is the brand of New York wind? You know, it's a uh, lovely snow falling down on the cobblestone streets of uh, Dumbo. It's a uh, young, handsome couple coming out of a Broadway play, hailing a taxi, jumping across the snow, getting on the taxi. It's so romantic. But the actual real brand promise of New York winter is slush <laughs> and hard, cold mountains of black snow. That's the actual brand, uh, brand presence of uh, winter in New York. Uh, or New York summer, you have uh, you know, attractive people in skimpy clothing frolicking around the city. Uh, you have Shakespeare in the Park. You have uh, you know, movies at Bryant Park at, at sundown. It's just really, really an, an amazing summer in New York until you actually get on a subway platform. <laughs> it's cool and it smells like pigs. Uh, those are the brand, uh, and that's the brand that's New York soccer. But now let's you know if you take it down one level to uh, something more personal, like for example the chocolate chip. I'll drink some water before you do that. <laughs> so there's uh, you know I love chocolate chip cookies. Um, I love them from whether they're a retail brand name or whether they're from the corner. You know, from the local Brooklyn store, uh, bakery, whatever. Um, you know, there's a, an awesome feeling of the cookie dough with the chocolate chips. Um, you know, you can dunk them in milk. It's perfect. You're watching a movie. It's really, really fantastic. Uh, the brand experience of the chocolate chip cookie. <coughs> uh, when, whenever I have to, whenever I have a like a, whenever me and uh, Brian and my wife are sitting here. Uh, whenever we have a craving for chocolate chip cookies, we'll go to the corner bodega or the, the grocery store uh, that's close by, and we'll get the, this is a preferred brand. Uh, beverage farm, they have to be soft baked. Uh, this is a special technique for uh, soft baking the cookies, which makes them so, a little bit more mushier, not as crusty. Um, it has to be chocolate chunk and it has to be dark chocolate, which is uh, perfectly bitter, not too bitter, it's sweet. Um, so these are two, two perfectly similar uh, bags of uh, beverage farm so soft baked dark chocolate chocolate chunk cookies. Um, yeah, the only difference is the price. And you know when I open these cookies, that's what I'm used to. You know, <laughs> the big chocolate chunks. You open it up. There's chocolate chunks in the middle. Um, there's chocolate chunks everywhere. The ratio of chocolate chips to, <laughs> to cookie dough is just perfect. Um, and then one day, I open the bag and I got that. There no, there's one little piece of chocolate chip in there. That was it. Um, you know, the brand bond that I had built with uh, Pepperidge Farm all of a sudden got broken. My expectations were diminished. Now, every time that I open a, a Pepperidge Farm bag, like, oh my God, will there be chocolate chip cookies in there? Will there be enough of them? You know, what if I get another one of these fiascos? <laughs> So just for comparison, it's all about uh, establishing a brand promise and keeping to it and keeping your customers happy. Once you break that promise, you know, once you break that delivery, just uh, you know, have, when your customers have doubt, it's no good. Um, so what happens when branding gets too close for comfort and you become the brand? Or, you know, you, the what? If you look at it, you know, uh, personalities are brands, you have certain, you establish certain parameter, parameters of how you dress, what you do, who you hang out with, all those are brand attributes that you establish. Um, but it can get a little bit too close. For example, here is 
there's a project that uh, an Australian designer named Christopher Doyle did recently, and it was posted on Swiss Miss, it was posted everywhere. And what he did was his personal brand guide guidelines, or identity guidelines. Um, if you don't love us, you know, you've done these documents where you establish, you know, what are the colors, what are the sizes of the logo should be, what are the, uh, the basic colors that are accepted. So he did this for himself. And it kind of like, you know, that's the, the basic color uh, setup. That's the seated casual, and that's the seated formal um, <laughs> application. And then he establishes the color palette. There's the, the core palette, which is black, you know, his black jeans. And that's the secondary palette that can change, you know, depending on what he wears. So these are all like his secondary palettes. Um, and then there's obviously the black and white version, because you never know when you're going to have to fax something. <laughs> Uh, this is kind of my favorite part, you have the minimum clear space, especially here in New York. You want to carry that around when you're in the summer, like, no, uh, my guidelines say that you will be closer uh, than specified here, so sir, please move uh, back that way a little bit more. And then inappropriate uses. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so true, nobody should ever uh, tie their flannel shirt around the way. So, <laughs> There's another aspect of personal branding that could be interesting, and that's the idea of, uh, you know, can people rebrand themselves? Uh, five years ago, before um, the funky carpenter named Ty was doing extreme makeovers with homes, and you had all these people, you know, all, you know, people that had horrible houses with huge mortgages, and they had really heartwarming stories of, you know, uh, courage and that they've done more for other people than they have done for themselves and they redo their homes with you know plasma TVs and whatever and everybody cries at the end even you know even even uh, you I want to cry you know your uh, your chin at least doesn't tremble when you're watching the end there's something wrong with you so before there was extreme makeover home edition there was just extreme makeover um, people edition so what they did is that they took uh, people that weren't favored by nature um, <laughs> And they would go on, on this horrible processes of surgeries and implants and uh, you know teeth shining. And when you have it, the people end up looking like either porn stars or uh, game show hosts. I don't know which one is worse. Um, but that's the basic premise. They take the people and then they make them uh, better. And then I thought, well, there's a, a really big parallel between this process and the results uh, between people and logos. Um, when you're when you're doing a rebranding for a corporation, you'll do a brand audit, and people will say, "Well, the our identity has been in play for far too long. It's going to own a little bit. Uh, it's not as new as it used to be. Uh, we're a great company now. We've changed. We want to real. We want to really communicate that." And people are the same. You have the friends coming on and say, "Well, she's a really great person, uh, great personality, but she's so shy because of her looks, whatever." So the kind of the way you criticize. But the way you establish the, the needs for these people and these logos, it's pretty much the same. And the results are also comparative. Um, <laughs> things just get plumper, you know, shinier, um, a little bit more round, especially in this area. <laughs> I'd like to do that back and forth. <laughs> so, rebranding applies to logos as well as people, and usually the results are bad across the board. Uh, but the one thing that you really have to remember about branding is that you know you have all these people, you know, all these companies spending so much money, they want to get to you no matter what. But what you have to remember is that branding is about you. Thank you. Ooh.